leadership of the Global Health Institute, uh, and also to all of you for organizing and allowing me to come here today. Um, <clears throat> I should just hire Jared to be my PR man. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, happy to have had the opportunity to work with, with Jerry and with uh, several others who are here in the audience today over the past several years uh, in Kenya. Uh, I will be talking a little bit about uh, some of our work in Kenya, but I'm actually, this is actually something new that I've been sort of thinking about and put together. So actually, to be honest with you, you are the first audience to have heard uh, my thoughts on a new science of global health, um, analytics, action, and ambiance. So we'll get started, and I'm happy to entertain any comments or questions as we go through. Uh, no corporate disclosures, and those are some of the federal grants that I may be referring to uh, during the presentation today. So first uh, is obviously the question of what is global health, and I don't want to take a ton of time on that, to be honest with you, because we could probably spend the entire hour just debating that particular topic. Um, but just to refer you all actually to a very nice editorial that uh, um, Shay Abimbola wrote in BMJ Global Health about a year ago, uh, where he sort of chronicled the history of, you know, quote unquote, colonial health, colonial medicine, uh, international health, global health, etc and uh, you know, summarized even Jeffrey Copeland's uh, sort of classic definition of global health, uh, but really sort of put emphasis on, from his perspective, two issues related to delivery science, uh, really towards uh, working towards equity <clears throat> in terms of being able to really sort of unify uh, quote unquote global health efforts wherever they may be, whether they be outside the US or inside the US or outside the UK or inside the UK, et cetera. Um, I wanted to add to that discovery because I think discovery science is also important in the context of uh, the work that we do in global health. But I, I, I just wish to sort of say that for me, global health is about discovery and delivery in the context of promoting health equity uh, wherever that may uh, happen. And so when I think about global health science with an eye towards promoting discovery, delivery, and equity, I'm thinking about six different pillars, which I've now categorized into sort of three main categories. So pillar one is connection, and I'll go over each of these uh, in turn. Pillar two is location. <coughs> uh, pillar three is resilience. And so I put these three together in the sort of category of analytics. And so these are the sort of the three analytic streams that I feel will be helpful in terms of thinking about global health. Analytics with respect to social networks and connection. Analytics with respect to spatial analytics and location. And analytics with respect to resilience and uh, vulnerability. Then I think about uh, creation and the actual design of interventions. Uh, and delivery uh, in terms of the actual delivery of interventions. And I put these two together in terms of action. Uh, so really thinking about human-centered design, uh, about global engineering, about actually coming up with solutions. And then thinking, obviously, about implementation research, health services research, delivery science in terms of the flow of delivery. <clears throat> and finally is the sort of idea of structure. So the thinking about the sort of broader socio-political, legal, regulatory frameworks within which all of those other activities occur. And so putting that uh, under the label of ambiance. I needed to come up with a third A. <laughs> um, and so that's how I decided to sort of label uh, these six pillars of global health science, again, working towards discovery, delivery, and equity, uh, uh, but categorized into these three A's, analytics, action, and ambiance. So if we move to analytics first, pillar one I call connection, which is essentially thinking about social network analysis and how it applies to global health. And what I'm going to be doing over the course of my talk today is just giving examples from the literature, some of which we've done some of which uh, I know from uh, colleagues of mine, uh, looking at each of these different <clears throat> pathways and pillars as they apply to global health, and hopefully to try and come up with a syncretic uh, whole. Um, and so if I look at our work in particular, Big Pick is uh, one of the uh, trials that we're doing in Kenya where we're bridging income generation with group integrated care, bringing together microfinance with group medical visits. And what we're hoping to do what we're hoping to do is to see if by bringing together microfinance and group medical visits, the proximate reason for this is to be able to address people's economic concerns and financial anxieties while also delivering medical care to them. But we're trying to see <clears throat> whether 
uh, we can actually change network characteristics in the context of these groups and have those network characteristics such as trust, cohesion, etc., cetera, uh, lead to improvements in uh, health factors and health behaviors and ultimately uh, uh, cardiovascular health status. <clears throat> and so we're thinking about network characteristics here as mediators along this causal pathway from intervention through to health outcome going through changes in network characteristics. And so to sort of think about this statistically, what we've done is work with our statistical colleagues to come up with these sort of mediation models. So we have I means intervention, SNC is social network characteristics, IF is intermediate factors, ultimately leading to CBD risk. And I'm happy to go through this in the Q&A later, but basically the idea is to come up with different mediation models that help to elucidate every single potential pathway connecting intervention through to intermediate factors in CBD risk, either going through social network characteristics or going around independent of social network characteristics. By putting all of this together, statistically, our team is going to be able to disentangle whether social network characteristics are along that uh, causal pathway connecting our intervention, group medical visits and microfinance, uh, with cardiovascular risk reduction. <clears throat> so we're treating, again, networks as, as something that is going to be impacted by our interventions and ultimately potentially uh, part of that causal pathway towards improved health status. And w what do I mean by social networks? And so the basic uh, sort of cartoon that I like to use is this one here where you sort of see these different nodes or individuals and they're connected to each other. There's a, obviously a cluster here that's very tightly connected. But you can see here that this network overall uh, has weaker ties than this network here on the right, which has much stronger ties, and the nodes are connected to each other, and even clusters are connected to each other in a way that this network is not. And so what we're hoping will happen in the context of our intervention is that by bringing people together to lend each other money, to share uh, illness stories with each other, to share illness experiences with each other, that we will shift them from, let's say, a weaker network initially towards a stronger network later on, in, characterized by increased trust and increased social cohesion. <clears throat> and in fact, when we look at some of our preliminary data from Big Pick, we actually see that at the beginning of our study, people were in these very fragmented, essentially binary dyads or triads in terms of their network experiences at the beginning. And after 12 months, you can see that actually you've formed now much stronger clusters uh, and much stronger networks overall. And so it actually, is, um, uh, it actually is supporting our hypothesis that bringing people together into these sort of intimate groups uh, is able to uh, improve and strengthen network characteristics. <coughs> the, next, uh, the next sort of, uh, sort of step beyond sort of thinking about networks as part of the sort of causal pathway is to actually say, let's try and intervene on networks themselves and let's use actually networks to be part of the intervention process. So this study is actually being done by uh, Christakis and some of his colleagues in Honduras, where what they're doing is they're actually saying, let's look at friendship networks <clears throat> and intervene upon not just friends, but the sort of friends of friends. Okay? And so here's one where they just look at uh, sort of nodes and their individual friends. But here is a network where they're intervening upon the network of friends of friends, and so really sort of strengthening the intervention target by sort of expanding their network. <clears throat> the hypothesis behind this intervention, which is about trying to improve maternal and child health in Honduras, is that if there is a social effect with respect to the impact of the intervention, that, well, let's just back up one step. If there's no social effect, you would expect that uh, there would essentially be this linear relationship between the percent targeted with the intervention and the percent reached with the intervention. <clears throat> However, if there is a social effect, meaning that people will share news of this intervention with each other or they'll share uh, some of the lessons learned with their neighbors or with their friends, that you would expect that there would be uh, initially maybe a slower uptake, but then as the sort of news of the intervention spreads, there will be rapid accelerated uptake. And if you can enhance that social effect by now tapping into friends of friends, you can actually shift this curve over to the left. Okay, so that's the hypothesis behind what Christakis and his colleagues are uh, in the process of implementing now in Honduras. And uh, you know, we'll see in the next couple of years whether their hypothesis is borne out or not. But the basic idea is that 
I think that it's important to think about the power of social connection and the power of networks in the context of some of the global health work that we do. So pillar two is location. And here I think about spatial analysis specifically. Spatial analysis as applied to health-seeking behavior, as applied to medication adherence, adherence to behavior change, even applied to health outcomes and vectors and zoonoses. And so here, for example, is an example of what you could consider, which is uh, a map here, essentially of uh, an <coughs> urban area, of um, relative social disadvantage, okay? And a heat map here of cardiovascular risk, okay? High cardiovascular risk in the red, low cardiovascular risk in the blue. And you can imagine that you can try and say, hey, is there a spatial correlation between social economic disadvantage and cardiovascular risk? Okay, and so part of what we are planning to do is to <clears throat> take a look, this is actually New York City, but to take a look at whether it's possible to, actually not, not New York City, sorry, but to, we're planning to see whether we can uh, map spatially socioeconomic disadvantage and overlay it with uh, the spatial surface of cardiovascular risk. And we're in the process of doing that actually in Iran. So we have a, a, a study that's ongoing now looking at the Golestan cohort study uh, where we're actually trying to see if there are spatial risk factors associated with cardiovascular events. And so what we're doing is we're looking at traditional cardiovascular risk factors, blood pressure, blood glucose, lipids, etc., but also spatial risk factors, things that may map out spatially and that are specific to neighborhoods and geography. So this includes air pollution, population density, proximity to traffic, proximity to health services, uh, neighborhood level socioeconomic environments, uh, and land cover, land use. And so you can imagine that you will be seeing spatial surfaces of pollution or land use land cover and spatial surfaces of cardiovascular mortality, cardiovascular events, and the question is whether there's any spatial correlation uh, between those two sets of, of factors. And so the reason why we feel um, motivated to do this type of work is if we look at Golestan, which is in the northern part of Iran, when we look at one-year mortality or one-year survival rates, you can see that everything looks fairly uniform across this geography. But if you look at now five-year survival rates, you can see that there is actually spatial variability in cardiovascular mortality. Okay, the purple and the red are experiencing lower survival rates than the, the communities in blue. And so you can see that there seems to be a spatial distribution of cardiovascular mortality uh, across this region of Iran. And when we look at um, either air pollution or light at night, you can see that there's also a spatial distribution of those risk factors as well. And so there's a spatial distribution of air pollution, air pollution greater in this region here. So the pink is lower air pollution, the green is higher air pollution. Uh, and, it mimic, and it sort of um, overlaps with uh, increased light at night. Uh, increased light at night here in this region and lower light at night at this region. And so the, what we're planning to do is to use what are called spatial frailty models that will also help to disentangle autocorrelation between these spatial risk factors to see if there's, a, again, a relationship between the spatial surfaces <coughs> of these spatial risk factors, pollution, light at night, land use, land cover, et cetera, and the spatial surface of cardiovascular events and cardiovascular mortality. So hopefully in about six months to a year, I'll have an answer to that story as well. Uh, another way that people have been able to use uh, spatial analysis to map out and to sort of represent uh, sort of, again, correlations between neighborhood or village level uh, or spatial risk factors and non-communicable diseases is, again, this example is actually very cool, what they call a ring map. Okay, and this is South Carolina and different, uh, I think, counties within South Carolina. And they map out here prevalence rate of uh, diabetes from low in white to high in black. And they're able to see all these other different spatial characteristics, poverty at the regional level, unemployment, food availability, et cetera, at the regional level, and map out how the um, diabetes prevalence maps to these different other spatial characteristics, okay? So just a different way of visualizing uh, the sort of spatial correlation between health outcomes and uh, spatial risk factors. And uh, there is a, a way of, again, moving now from thinking about just spatial description, discovery, 
So now thinking about how can you actually use spatial analysis to help inform interventions. And so this actually is from work being done uh, uh, in malaria about bed net distribution where they've actually come up with what's called a spatial decision support system. So very similar to what we think of in terms of clinical decision support. So in hypertension, like if the blood pressure is above a certain level, you should increase medications or titrate medications higher. Here they're actually using a funky spatial, uh, spatial uh, decision support system to help inform how and where they should be distributing malaria bed nets. <clears throat> so it's an interesting way of thinking about, again, similar to what we looked at with network analysis, to have spatially informed interventions rather than just looking at spatial factors as part of the discovery pathway. <clears throat> the reason why I think this is going to be increasingly important is obviously the phenomenon of uh, migration is huge in the world. Uh, you know, the U.S. is also a land of immigrants. Many other uh, parts of the world uh, experience both uh, long-term as well as short-term migration flows. And um, there's actually been the Lancet Commission on Migration and Health, just published last year, where they give a very nice conceptual model of what it means to do either short-term or long-term transits or destination uh, visits. Um, but there's also obviously a huge, we've seen a huge rise in the number of refugees uh, across the world. And again, I think that just this concept of thinking about migration, mobility patterns, and spatially, ex spatial experiences as they apply to health, I think will be important in terms of thinking about global health. Again, we are not immobile static entities. We are mobile um, <clears throat> uh, human beings who move around, whether it's in our daily lives or across the, the year, or across our lifespan. And thinking about that mobility in a spatial way, I think will also be important. I was hoping, I think this was uh, an older set of slides, I was actually hoping to include Rebecca's study that she did in Kenya as a cautionary tale with respect to <laughs> spatial analysis. And, um, and, and I'm sorry that I somehow, maybe it was in a, a different set of slides, but, they, uh, but Rebecca and Jerry did actually some very elegant work where they looked at rheumatic heart disease prevalence and they actually saw spatial clustering of rheumatic heart disease uh, in particular areas. <clears throat> and uh, it actually looked very exciting. They had a very cool map, actually, uh, where they were able to show what looked like spatial clustering. Uh, but then when they controlled for even just regular um, sort of demographics, age, sex, distance to the health facility, et cetera, that spatial clustering essentially uh, disappeared. Uh, and so essentially that clustering was all due to the sort of general types of uh, characteristics that we think about even in just normal statistical analyses. And so just a cautionary tale that uh, what may initially look like uh, cool spatial clustering may actually just be masking uh, demographics that are uh, sort of spatially distributed as well. And apologies, I had put that in, but somehow it didn't show up on, on my slide set today. Uh, pillar three, resilience. Um, so resilience, uh, and here I'm talking about specifically recovery from shocks. And so this comes from uh, the agricultural <laughs> economics field, where they have looked, where agricultural e economists have seen how do individuals and communities recover from drought, famine, um, floods, uh, pests, et cetera, in the context of uh, damaged harvests and damaged crops, and how can they recover? Do they recover slowly or do they recover quickly? And we're thinking about now increasingly applying resilience analytics to health. And I sort of think about it also as like sort of a version 3.0 of socioeconomic status. So thinking about all of the characteristics that go into individual and community level res resilience um, that may include class, race, ethnicity, social position, education, et cetera, but may also include birth order, birth month, uh, which neighborhood you live in, et cetera. And so the idea behind resilience is you can think of it as a, what's called a quote-unquote recovery trajectory. So if you have time here on the x-axis and whatever you want on the y-axis, so this is food security, um, you can imagine that you have two different households or two different individuals coming along like this. You have a shock. You have this uh, household or individual that experiences a, a pretty significant decline in household food security. It takes a while for them to recover and they never recover back to baseline. You have this uh, second household, however, that experiences less of a shock, a, a quicker return to baseline, uh, and then proceeds on. Okay, so that's the basic idea behind thinking about resilience as a shock trajectory. 
sorry, resilience as a recovery trajectory. And I think what's important for me here, and I think it's illustrated well in the next slide, this comes from Erwin Nippenberg and his colleagues, where they looked at um, food security and years since the drought. And you can see here again this, this idea of a, a pretty big uh, drop in food security and then a return, a slow return to baseline, whereas people who uh, were uh, more secure had a less uh, steep drop and a quicker uh, recovery. Okay, I hope that's very clear to everybody. The key to me is the following, is that if you were to measure the impact looking at baseline versus final time uh, end, let's just say, it would almost look as if the intervention had zero impact, right? People start off at the same level, and at year four, they end off at the same level. And you would think, hey, the, in the intervention actually had zero impact. But actually, you can imagine that the trajectory of this individual here, or this family here, was very different from the trajectory of this individual or this family here. And so if we take that sort of trajectory approach, uh, we can see actually that the intervention, essentially this area under the curve, was very different for this individual or this family versus this one here. And that's where I think the power of resilience analytics uh, comes in. We can also think of resilience as a probability. Again, here the idea is you set a threshold, um, let's say, well-being level uh, here along the x-axis and the probability on the y-axis. And you can imagine what is the probability of being food secure or being healthy to the right of that threshold level. And you can see here that you have different curves <coughs> depending on how resilient or how probable it is for you to be in the healthy category. Okay, and so you can imagine that this curve here represents uh, an individual or a group of individuals who have a higher probability of being healthy and therefore more resilient than this group of individuals here that have a higher probability of being uh, less healthy. Okay, does that make sense in terms of thinking about resilience as a probability? And again, they've shown that, uh, if, for example, if you own livestock in the blue, you're able to uh, have more resilience and more security with respect to food consumption than if you do not own livestock. Okay, and so it's actually a very elegant way of being able to use a resilience um, uh, analysis uh, with respect to the sort of probability density as well. You can imagine that, this, that those examples are very simple, thinking about just single shocks at single points in time, or single event, or single sort of uh, thresholds at single points in time, but you know, mathematically and conceptually you can get much more, whoops, much more complicated by thinking about shock trends and about multiple shocks happening at different times or multiple types of shocks happening simultaneously, etc. And you can imagine how the math would become uh, sort of much more complex as you try and put all of these things together. <clears throat> and so, again, I go back to Big Pick. We didn't uh, plan it out initially, but I'm actually now very tempted to think about how we can apply resilience analytics to our big pick trial, meaning by bringing people together again to make a little bit of money and improve their financial well-being, are we somehow being able to create more resilience in that group of people than in our control populations? And I'm thinking that it might be interesting to apply a resilience lens to some of our big pick analysis as well. And then uh, there's a way that we can think about resilience, not just at the individual level, but at the community level or at the system level. And so there are, in, there are folks out there that are doing work, again, at resilience, not just at the individual or community, but also at the healthcare system level. And what this does is it actually leads us now to thinking again, similar to what we had talked about before with respect to network-informed uh, interventions, or spatially-informed <coughs> interventions. If you think about now a resilience-informed intervention, it means thinking about what are the community assets that are in the community that allow for promotion of health. And so thinking about an asset-based uh, intervention to help promote community resilience. There's some fascinating work going on with this uh, with uh, Emily Wong out in Yale uh, in some of the New Haven communities. Uh, and this is, uh, again, sort of another example of thinking about how to improve community resilience through an asset-based intervention approach, looking at all of these different types of activities leading to both short and long-term outcomes. Uh, okay, so those are my three sort of thoughts about analytics, right? Network analytics, spatial analytics, and resilience analytics, both from a perspective of discovery as well as from a perspective of delivery, uh, all with an eye towards equity. So now if we move to action, 
uh, pillar four I've labeled as creation, this idea of how do you actually design and develop and put together the intervention. So design and design thinking, global engineering, quote unquote <coughs> tinkering or maker movement, etc. And human-centered design here is this idea of using quote unquote a designerly mindset uh, that really looks at people's lived experiences um, and rooted in the needs and context of the end users. And I, I gave this example in the morning, and so I apologize to those who've already heard it. But my favorite example of, like, sort of one of the um, sort of examples of human-centered design is the classic elevator problem. So all of us have experienced elevators. There's always a ton of wait time. You're always, like, you know, sitting around, bored, twiddling your thumbs, trying to figure out, like, you know, how do you make these elevators go faster? And you can, you can come up with all sorts of engineering solutions to... Uh, make them go faster, more responsive, have one of them start at level five rather than always at the ground floor, or whatever it might be, but there's always a non-zero weight. <clears throat> so someone came along and said, you know what, actually the experience of people is not necessarily waiting, but is boredom. And maybe we should address boredom rather than wait time. So they put mirrors down at the bottom of the elevator banks, and then all of a sudden people are like, looking at themselves, they're combing their hair, they're putting on makeup, they're checking out other people, whatever it is, and all of a sudden people are no longer bored. And so now if you go around and see, all these fancy hotels all have mirrors at the bottom of their elevator banks, and that has essentially helped solve the problem. So this idea of really trying to rethink what the problem is to help you rethink solutions. Okay? That's the idea of human-centered design. And it goes through... Um, a cycle of planning, learning, creative, like iterative testing, multiple rounds of iteration before you finally implement and scale. And um, I see Claudia here, and we've actually um, uh, referenced our big pick uh, human search design uh, this morning. So I was giving a different example here this afternoon that has actually uh, leveraged uh, some of Claudia's work uh, using human centered design uh, in Kenya. And we're using the same process now for another project that we're doing in Kenya called Strengths, Strengthening Referral Networks for Management of Hypertension Across the Health System. <clears throat> and basically, uh, and anyone who's done human-centered design will recognize all of the like posted pads and uh, putting stuff out on the tables and whatnot, but basically bringing together stakeholders from a variety of different perspectives, having them brainstorm and generate ideas um, and go through this whole process of inspiration, brainstorming, conceptualization, creation, and iteration. And when we did this uh, with our team in Strengths, we initially did sort of a practice run to try and say, how can we make uh, food in Kenya more healthy? And so these were some of the solutions they came up with, sort of as doing in the context of doing a practice run before we did it for our actual intervention. But then when we moved it to our Strengths intervention, we really had to think about, again, what was the end user experience? What was the patient's experience when it came to uh, the referral pathway? So the clinician had to decide to refer, they had to complete the referral form, they had to notify the patient, and then the idea was that the patient had to sort of go through the referral process, and our intervention was trying to say, can peer navigators help sort of help chaperone this patient through their referral experience? And so when we thought about where does human-centered design fit in, uh, we figured that it's not going to fit in for every single aspect of the intervention. Some of them are already pre-designed, but there are some places where it makes sense for human-centered design to enter in, in terms of communication platforms, meeting structures, the information available, and what this actual navigation chaperoning process would be. And so in the context of that work, uh, we've actually come up with sort of three main components now after several sessions of uh, a multi-stakeholder-based human-centered design process where we've brought together uh, village representatives, community representatives, clinician representatives, peer navigator representatives, etc., to really think about facility-based peer support, <coughs> thinking about a central resource for uh, each county, and thinking about this idea of structured sensitization and feedback to our clinician providers. So those are the sort of three main overarching <coughs> principles, and we're in the process now of doing pilot testing and feasibility and appropriateness testing of that pilot intervention. When we started this work in Kenya with Claudia, now five years ago, uh, we were probably amongst the first to really sort of be doing this type of thing. Um, and uh, Claudia is actually in the process of sort of trying to uh, disseminate this in the form of a publication, which hopefully will come out soon. Um, 
In the meantime, this work has now sort of been taken up by other folks in several different places. So this is just an example from India of what they call design-focused implementation. And I sort of want to say, keep your eye on that phrase, because my guess is that over the next decade or so, design-focused implementation will be the sort of catchphrase that people use uh, in the context of merging design thinking and implementation research. They came up with a very simple uh, conceptual model, and I'm kicking myself for not having written this paper myself <laughs> five years ago. <laughs> Um, okay, moving on to pillar five, delivery, which is about delivery science, implementation research, health services research, quality improvement, thinking about the supply chain, process evaluation, et cetera. Um, and so uh, anyone who's involved in implementation research recognizes this implementation pipeline, the sort of classic paper from Mittman and Kern in 2012, where you start off with efficacy studies, whether they be clinical, behavioral, or health services, you then move into sort of more of the real world of effectiveness studies, implementation practice, and then within the sort of spectrum of implementation trials, there are these sort of classically three hybrid types of implementation research trials, type one, type two, type three, and I'm happy to go into detail in the Q&A if you want, in terms of how those things are distinguished in terms of the focus on the um, biological outcome or health intervention versus the uh, focus on the implementation strategy and the process outcome. There are so many different models of implementation research out there, I decided to put my own cartoon out there for the world to chew on as well. So um, I was trying to sort of uh, stake, a, stake ground to say that implementation research should be this transdisciplinary approach where you bring together all these different disciplines to speak a common language. And if you look at all of our studies, whether it be big pick or strengths or whatnot, we've actually successfully, I think, been able to bring together anthropologists, economists, uh, clinicians, <coughs> pharmacists, uh, nurses, etc., to really try and uh, speak this common language of implementation research. But that's what it takes. You need qualitative methods, you need quantitative methods, you need methods that come from economics and business, uh, as well as the input of folks from the information technology and human performance engineering side as well, to really think about how to identify problems, analyze determinants, to develop solutions, implement those interventions, and evaluate the outcomes. When we again think of the research pipeline, um, similar to what I showed you before, implementation research is really about moving into the real world, moving beyond um, the sort of laboratory setting, and thinking about even further sustainability, dissemination, scale up, and scale out. One of the key elements of implementation research is process evaluation, so really thinking about what worked for whom and what didn't work for, for whom and why did it work and why did it not work, et cetera. If you think about any interventions, even within the medical center or medical field, it's almost uh, never the case that an intervention works universally well for everybody. There are certain people for whom it works better and for certain people it doesn't work as well. So process evaluation is a way to uh, sort of systematically go about trying to figure out who it works for, uh, for and why and why not. So, and, oops. Some of the uh, components of process evaluation include fidelity, dose delivered, dose received, both exposure and satisfaction, recruitment and reach, and context. And again, I'm happy to go over these in more detail in the Q&A if people are interested. So I wanted to think about a sort of a separate topic within implementation research, which is this idea of adaptation. So again, uh, some of the work that we do in Kenya, people say, well, how would you now transport it to um, other parts of Kenya, or how would you think about transporting it even to, let's say, Durham or wherever it might be? And this, uh, David Chambers, actually, uh, out of the National Cancer Institute, has put together a very nice framework that he calls the ad adaptome, so similar to the genome or to the metabolome or to this ome or that ome. Uh, he likes to call it the adaptome, which is essentially a categorization of different ways of adapting an intervention to different settings. And you can imagine that you have a baseline intervention, and you put it into certain settings or with certain adaptations, it does better. You put it into other settings or other adaptations, and it does worse. And so this is just a way of mapping out which adaptations work for which particular setting or not. And if you think about where adaptation can happen, it can happen in the context of service setting, in terms of target audience, in terms of the mode of delivery, in terms of cultural adaptations, 
And then what are the actual core components of an intervention? So again, if I think back to Big Pick and our combination of microfinance and group medical visits, some of these adaptations might be about the size of the group, about the composition of the group, about what that microfinance should actually be manifest as, whether it should be just table banking or whether there should be an external bank, what should the group medical visit look like, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can imagine that, uh, that well, if I go back to here, Big Pick is here, but Big Pick Ghana might be up here, and Big Pick Durham or Cleveland might be something like this, okay? So that sort of idea. And he's done a very nice way, sort of job of trying to think about what would this Adaptome data platform be? So sort of thinking about interventions in all these different places, what are the core components in each place and what are the elements of adaptation in each place? And so, again, I just want to bring it to your attention that this idea of really formally thinking about adaptation, context, and whatnot is, again, sort of a next frontier with respect to implementation research in global health. The other idea that David Chambers also has put together is this idea of the dynamic sustainability framework. And so thinking about uh, the idea of how do you make interventions sustainable, both within the context that you first start working in, as well as potentially in a scaled out or scaled up context. And, and he has put together this idea of it being a dynamic process so that the intervention never stays static and ossified, but that it actually sort of modifies and evolves as time goes along as well. And they have a very nice picture here of intervention X, maybe it doesn't fit exactly into context A, but the context changes and the intervention changes. You'll see how there are these very subtle changes as you go through the implementation cycle until finally you get it to, to match. And so the idea is that you shouldn't expect that sort of match to happen uh, at time one, but that the idea of sustainability is to ultimately work towards that match rather than thinking that the match needs to be the same all throughout time. So it's a very dynamic uh, framework, which I think is actually a very nice way of thinking about sustainability. And then uh, finally, uh, thinking about scale-up and thinking about, um, how, uh, again, sort of moving from implementation in one setting to scaling up or scaling out. And here I just wish to sort of highlight the framework put together by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, uh, where they've thought about the different phases of scale-up, that's fine but really thinking about what are the mechanisms of adoption? What are the kinds of things that you need in order for scale up to happen? So leadership, communication, social networks again, and this idea of a culture of urgency and persistence. And what are the support systems that will help to support scale up to happen? Learning systems, data systems, infrastructure, human capacity, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, I like to sort of think of this uh, Institute for Health and uh, Healthcare Improvement framework in the context of scale up that it's not just the scalable unit and going to full scale. You really need to think about what are the mechanisms of adoption and what are the larger support systems that will allow to facilitate uh, scale up. So, in, again, thinking about our program, Big Pick, in Kenya, what would it take for it to actually scale up to the rest of the country or to the rest of the continent in terms of these adoption mechanisms and support systems? And then finally, uh, thinking about scale up and scale out, there's a very cool statistical technique called transportability that basically allows you to say, if you've taken something in place A and you want to now move it to place B, either scale in a scaled up fashion or a scaled out fashion, how can you statistically predict or analyze whether or not that scale up is actually happening or not. So there's this uh, funky statistical uh, field called transportability. And I'll be honest with you, I was actually up till close to midnight last night looking for a simple picture. And there are no simple pictures because it's actually a very complicated uh, 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 scenario. Um, but transportability basically is this idea, if I, if I want to go from X to Y, how transportable is that? And how much does Z uh, get involved with that idea of, of transportability. So, uh, and then is, is Z independent or is Z dependent on some other external factor or is Z potentially on the causal pathway? Again, I'm happy to go conceptually into the details and during the Q&A. Do not ask me about the math because the math is, is way too complicated for me for sure. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a very funky uh, statistical way of actually being able to think about scale up in a quantitative fashion beyond the qualitative uh, uh, notions of scale that we already think about. And then finally, ambiance. So pillar six is this idea of structure. Thinking about all of the other environmental things 
that, that uh, determine, predetermine, uh, restrict, or support uh, some of our interventions, whether they be in the fields of agriculture, urban planning, trade, food regulation, security, ethics, etc. And uh, just a couple of examples here, looking at the relationship between trade agreements and health. Basically, there is this conceptual model that trade agreements, by impacting foreign direct investment and trade in goods, through you know, this whole chain of mechanisms, can change, for example, in this case, the volume and um, amount of sugary, sugar-sweetened beverages that may be consumed in a particular place. And these researchers were in particular interested in looking at the free trade agreement that happened between the United States and Peru in the mid-2000s, around 2006, I believe, was when ratification happened and enforcement happened in 2009. And they wanted to compare what happened in Peru with respect to what happened in Bolivia, essentially a comparison country that did not have a free trade agreement with the United States. And there were certain uh, aspects that were healthier and other aspects that were not healthier. So actually, so this is... Um, Looking at uh, liters per capita of sugar-sweetened beverages actually uh, were less in Peru than in Bolivia after this free trade agreement. Uh, bottled water was actually increased in Peru versus Bolivia as a result of the free trade agreement. Uh, but sweetened juices were also increased, and these like sort of sports or athletic drinks, you know, those sort of Gatorade type things, also increased. And so the idea is that it, trade agreements may not necessarily be purely pro-health or purely anti-health, but that trade agreements obviously have an impact on the sort of uh, option sets that are made available to us in terms of the choices we can make with respect to, for in, in this instance, sugar-sweetened beverages. Uh, similarly, uh, how does housing impact health? And so some researchers up in Boston have done some very sophisticated techniques looking at the housing crisis and foreclosures in the Massachusetts area and impact on health. And what they were able to show is that for, for every foreclosure within 100 meters of an individual, the BMI of that individual actually increased by 0.2 units uh, for every single foreclosure that happened. So you can imagine that if a foreclosure ha five foreclosures happened in your neighborhood, your BMI would actually increase by a full point, you know, that kind of thing. And so they were able to show very uh, robustly that uh, foreclosures that were proximate in distance and also proximate in time one year before uh, had that uh, po uh, sort of adverse correlation with increasing BMI. And they did some very interesting sensitivity analyses, <coughs> looking at three years before, five years before, or one year after, to make sure that their time uh, sort of model in terms of causation was appropriate. And they were able to show that none of the other time periods uh, showed any significant relationship with uh, BMI change, but the one year before time period did. And so this idea that the stress of having foreclosures happen to you leads you to have adverse behavior, sort of uh, health behaviors and increasing uh, um, BMI. And they've shown the same for blood pressure as well. And then thinking about uh, climate change and health. And again, here, a very complicated uh, scenario because there are certain things about increasing temperature that are going to be health promoting and certain things about increasing temperature that will adversely affect health. And, this paper uh, does a very nice job of categorizing the changes in temperature, changes in rainfall, cloud amounts, uh, ozone uh, exposure, et cetera, in terms of things in blue uh, essentially being a little bit more health promoting and things in red being uh, adverse health uh, impacts. I must say the challenge of looking at climate change and health is really formidable uh, because the pathways are so indirect, so long-term, uh, and the estimates are you know, uh, challenging to sort of state with certainty. But you can see here that depending on which scenario you look at, <coughs> you can come up with a variety of different potential trajectories. But the basic idea is, in a way it's sort of like, you know, which Bible do you want to read, but you know, which set of uh, predictions do you want to sort of believe in, in terms of how much temperature change will happen over the next 30, 40 years. But you can see here that regionally, it makes a difference, and obviously according to which model you have, it makes a difference. It's a very complicated science, but again, in my head, it feels like it's going to be one of those next frontiers of global health science as well. Uh, finally, to think about structure, again, not from a discovery perspective, but in terms of a delivery perspective, how can we actually now incorporate health into all policies? And so the CDC actually has a very uh, nice way of thinking about how you incorporate health into housing policy, <coughs> trade policy, uh, regulatory issues, etc. So I, I wish us to sort of think about 
transsectoral and transdisciplinary problem solving, again, not from a discovery perspective, but now from a delivery perspective. Uh, and here's an example from the Bay Area Health Initiatives where they're encouraging us to think about moving more upstream. So rather than just dealing with risk behaviors, diseases, and mortality, think about living conditions, institutional inequities, and social inequities, and sort of really think about moving upstream in terms of the structure that informs uh, sort of ultimate uh, downstream health events. Point it up. <laughs> um, so, thinking about again these six pillars of global health science connection, location, resilience, creation, delivery, and structure, all with an eye towards again discovery, delivery, and equity. And sort of thinking about it as categorized uh, into analytics, action, and ambiance. And the hope is that it's global health science but it will actually lead us to overall improvements in population health science, thinking about policy, <coughs> uh, transforming care delivery, uh, turning information into insight, engaging community, really with an eye towards improving population health and health equity overall. So thank you. <laughs> Happy to entertain any questions, and also any criticisms, actually. <laughs> As I put together the paper, I'd like to get reviewer comments early. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, Raj, I have a question. So, um, you talked about financing at the individual level, um, you know, vis a vis some of the, the big hit work. Um, where do you see um, health insurance coverage um, in this? And, and which of the, the pillars or the steps do you think things like universal health coverage? Um, how that impacts, um, you know, how we think about incorporating that into global health science. Yeah, sure. No, it's a very good uh, question. <clears throat> At some level, it's obviously a, a sort of a quote-unquote structure or ambiance level factor in, in terms of the fact that it sort of impacts uh, the kinds of choices that people have and the burdens that they may face when sort of interacting with the health system. Uh, but it is very health focused and so, you know, at some level there's a little bit of um, arbitrariness with respect to where you may categorize it per se, but I would probably put it either into quote unquote delivery or ambiance, and depending on the nature of the exact uh, uh, manifestation. Yeah. Um, so in talking about social networks, I like how you've kind of flipped it and something that used to maybe be considered contamination in research, which was, you know, people talking about an intervention or sharing an intervention with one another now being seen as more of a strength um, to kind of leverage that for, for good. Um, but I imagine it creates some kind of measurement problems. How do you kind of isolate, you know, dosage and what, what comes from the intervention itself versus what comes from more of this kind of social facilitation or your communication environment. Yeah, and, and I must say again, the, the math behind that level of uh, sort of disentanglement uh, of the sort of network components and what they call spillover effects, et cetera, incredibly complicated. Um, but again, Christakis and his group, and there's some other guys who are doing it like in um, University of Southern California, like our colleague Tom Valente and others, are sort of looking at uh, those, what they call spillover effects, about the topology of the network, et cetera. I mean, there's a lot of very cool sort of surface math that's happening to try and uh, answer exactly that question. I, I must say, I, I am only able to answer you from a conceptual perspective, because I'm a consumer of it. Uh, it's sort of like buying a Lexus or whatever. Uh, as long as it's smooth and drives well, I don't really need to know exactly how the engine's working, you know? Okay, thank you.